this experience occurred when I was a little kid. And I'll just, I'll just tell you what that was, uh, because it, it has been meaningful to me. Uh, what happened was I climbed up on this uh, dresser, and maybe the dresser was maybe the height of my shoulders or something like that. And I climbed up there, and I threw a pillow up there, and I was going to uh, call my brother. I used to share a room with my older brother. And I was going to call him into the room and then just rain terror from him from this elevated, advantaged <laughs> position. Um, I was maybe four years old, maybe four or five years old. And, uh, but what happened was, as he mentioned, I fell. I was on my knees on top of this dresser and fell backwards. And as I was falling, and it, you know, it's a very disconcerting situation to be falling backwards, even for a four-year-old. Even a four-year-old knows when he's got real problems. <laughs> but as I fell, I remember my mom told me that I could reach out to God in such a situation, and so I did. I said, God, you've got to help me. And an idea came to me, and it was um, to interlock my fingers like that and to put my hands behind my head. So of course now, that's palms down as you're falling. And I came into contact with a doorknob, um, a, you know, about waist high. And it came into my hands, and I caught it. And then my feet came down flat on the floor. The whole thing was over. Um, I, I don't think I ever mentioned that to my mom, but I have thought about it, <laughs> you know, since. Because um, what, it's, what it suggests is that there's a presence. There's an omnipresence. There's a very presence of a divine influence. And, uh, and that presence is available and accessible immediately, you know, midair, midair. Um, I'm going to introduce a book. They've got some copies out here. If you don't have one, I recommend you grab one. Um, this is called Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. It was written about 150 years ago by a woman named Mary Baker Eddy, who lived in New England. And um, if, like I say, if you don't have one, I, I think I would grab one. Somehow you got this far today. I wouldn't leave, honestly, without, without this book. Um, but I wanted to share one thing right from the preface of this book. I mean, in the Roman numerals, <laughs> it says, now as then, these mighty works are not supernatural, but supremely natural. They are the sign of Emmanuel, God with us, a divine influence ever present in human consciousness and repeating itself. So I'd just like to kind of kick this off by, by saying we're talking about a divine influence that is ever present. And it's ever present in human consciousness. And it's constant and it's, and it's alert. And not only is it present, it's, it's loving. It like wants us to succeed. It wants the little kid to find his answer midair. Now, the first thing I kind of want to touch on is that we're not talking about some study, some ology. We're not talking about Scientology. We're not talking about, um, let's say, time management or physics. This is divine metaphysics. Um, in, in, if you were looking at um, time management, you're starting from a, a point of limitation. You're starting from a point that you have a limited something. You guys had time management seminars, by the way? Yeah. We have all had those. I could tell you a joke, but I don't want to waste the time. <laughs> uh, in those basic time management seminars, there's, there's this sense that you have this precious thing, a factor called time. And if you allow it to get away from you, or if you squander it or waste it, then that's to your detriment. But what we're talking about today is something a little different. We're really just talking about freedom from limitation. It's just freedom. The ability to do whatever you need to do. The ability to um, accomplish in almost no time at all what needs to be accomplished. So rather than set yourself up, you ever heard the phrase, don't set yourself up to fail? Um, rather than setting yourself up to operate within a time, a time constraint, set yourself up free and say, I can do whatever I need to do. For instance, rather than saying, 
does the clock suggest that I can accomplish this? Rather than saying that, why don't we say, is this right for me to do? It's not what can I do, it's what should I do? Okay, now in, in physics, time is what is called a fundamental quantity. There are seven fundamental quantities. There used to be five, there used to be four, now there are seven, and time is among them. But even in physics, time is sort of problematic. It's kind of squishy, like things, things shift around and, they, and they've, they've witnessed it. It's not just theoretically, it's, it's in, in real terms, it's observable. And so they've done a lot to try to explain it. They've written um, you know, thousands of pages, like uh, special relativity was an attempt to address this. There's a theory called the um, Bell's theorem of inequality. There's a theory called the entanglement theory. You might have heard of that, where somehow there's a, a particle entangled with another particle elsewhere in the universe because things happen between them that is physically impossible. And Einstein called it spooky action at a distance. <laughs> now, I came across a book a couple of years ago by um, a physicist named George Musser, contributing editor for Scientific American magazine. And he wrote a book called Spooky Action at a Distance. He said, Albert Einstein struggled with these strange occurrences, and his description of them gives this book its title, Non-Local Phenomena so violate what we believe about the physical world that they appear almost magical. It, it violates what we've come to expect, so much so that it appears almost magical. And then he goes on and he says, um, he said time and space, he said ever since there have been physical sciences, they've been based on a spatial and temporal view of the world. That's uh, space and time, spatial and temporal. Um, and then he's, but he goes on and he says, contrary to this, space and time may not be fundamental ingredients of the world. Instead, they may be constructions. And every time you have a construction, you can have an imperfection in that construction, which of course we do with time. There's usually some little adjustment that has to be made, like they'll tweak the world clock by a couple of milliseconds, and you'll read about it and say last night the clock changed a little bit. Or, um, you know, even uh, daylight savings time, or even these time zones that we operate within. It's just a way to use this tool. Time's not a problem. It's a tool. It just isn't, uh, it isn't a boss. Time doesn't own anything, and it can't drive anything. Uh, time can't even think. Time is a, is a tick, 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 and life is a, con a, is a continuum. I don't know if you noticed, but one of those slides that ran prior to the lecture is um, that in ancient Greece, they understood time two different ways. One is chronos, which is you know, the chronometer that we wear on the wrist, and the other is called uh, kairos, the interval outside of time in which everything real happens. Okay? So even the ancient Greeks understood the nature of this, and we're, we're gonna kind of hopefully unfold a little bit of it for our, our own benefit today. In metaphysics, time is totally irrelevant. It is absolutely irrelevant in a metaphysical discussion, time, both time and space. For instance, uh, let's say, um, you know, Golden Gate Bridge. I, I, I came across the Golden Gate Bridge a couple of weeks ago. Um, but if I even mention those three words, you have a fairly immediate understanding of what we're talking about. You don't have to go uh, up to Northern California, or you don't have to do it. You can understand it. It's because it's a metaphysical concept. Same thing is true if I were to say something like, um, you know, Eiffel Tower. You're not buying euros and checking schedules to consider that concept. It's a concept. It's a metaphysical concept, and it's immediate. You could do the same thing, let's say, with um, your childhood home, or your elementary school or something that's a, con a concept, a mental concept, a metaphysical concept beyond physics. And there is no space or time associated with that. And in fact, this concept of immediacy begins to become apparent. Um, immediate simply means nothing in between. 
There's no medium. There's nothing that needs to happen. It all, it's already done. It has that connotation of already done. But I pulled a few little verses from the Bible that um, relate to this topic, this concept of time. And this one, right, this is from Isaiah. Before they call, I will answer. That sounds like immediacy, doesn't it? That sounds like already done, actually. It sounds like even prior to immediate, it's already done. Before. Somebody saw that. Isaiah, whenever he lived. What was that, 3,000 years ago or so? Isaiah glimpsed something, and he wrote it down this way. And somehow through the translations, it's come down to us in this form. But it's somebody that glimpsed a truth about life. The word of God is quick. Well, quick is a time reference, right? How quick? Immediate. It's super quick. It's beyond quick. It's already done. Very present. Well, present has a, a space connotation and, and as well as a time connotation, right? Present here and present now. Right here now. Very present. How present? Very present. Immediately present. Omnipresent. Um, always present. How did that read in the, uh, in the preface here? A divine influence ever present in human consciousness and repeating itself. It's that present. God shall help her, and that right early. You know, when my mother told me when I was four years old that I could reach out to God if I got into real trouble, what do you suppose got into her thought that made her say that to me? I can guess. <laughs> she had a son. She had a son. And I believe what she was witnessing was an ever-expanding uh, 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 scope of activity of this little dude, and, and she uh, realized she wouldn't always be there. And so she wanted to prepare the little guy. Okay, well that's early. God helped her. She was an alert mother, and she was, she was sharp enough to prepare the little kid before he was midair. Okay, so God is early. You know, we talked about this a second ago. It's not going to take an hour for us to come to a thought that's going to change things for us. It'll happen just like that. And by the way, if that had read in the, in the blink of an eye, these days you can slow down a blink. You can super slow-mo that and time it. You can't time a twinkle. <laughs> right? A twinkle is now. It's immediate. It's, it's a divine thing. It's a twinkle. Um, you know, I want to talk just briefly about this book. This is a brand new copy. I just put it into service uh, about a week ago. The other one that I used was so badly beat up. They do get used. These books get used hard. It's called a textbook for life. People have um, referred to it every single day. You can find um, almost any uh, aspect of uh, experience human experience, uh, you'll find referenced in here, including time. There's a lot of references to time, uh, including uh, health. There's a lot of in, uh, reference to uh, a divine sense of health, including um, like a, f a financial well-being, just a, a, a freedom of life. Um, there's a lot in this book. And as I say, if you don't have one, uh, I would grab one. It was originally published uh, about 150 years ago. 1875, and it was, um, it's been republished and recopyrighted numerous times over the last hundred years. As a matter of fact, the copies that they have out here might have a different cover on it, uh, but don't, don't be confused. It's the same book. The, the text is um, um, unchanged. So anyway, I'd like to, to, to recommend that to you. And, and just a, a word about the author. I think it'd be good for us to know just a, a little about the woman who wrote this book. Her name was Mary Baker Eddy. She was born in Bow, New Hampshire, almost 200 years ago. And just think of the limits that would have been on a young girl in New Hampshire 200 years ago. She couldn't vote. Um, even getting an education would have, would have not been a priority for uh, anyone. Um, 
there was no, um, there was no way for her to like own property. There are a lot of limits. But instead of accepting those limits, she was like a natural metaphysician. She just kind of pushed back against all of that. And so rather than sort of asking the clock, what can I do? Or what, asking the world around her, what can I do? What can a young girl do? She said, what does God want me to do? That was the, the key difference, I'd say. Rather than looking at the world and trying to get the world to explain itself to her, she asked God, what is this life? What do you need, what, what, what do you need from me? And she responded to that. And in doing so, she ended up with a very solid education for a girl of her time. She ended up uh, being her own author, authored her own books. She founded her own magazines. I know they've got some copies of the current issues of the magazines that she founded. The first magazine she founded was uh, in 1883. It's been published every month ever since. She was the original uh, editor and publisher. But um, she, lit, she led an unlimited life, and a spiritually unlimited life. She didn't allow the mortal limitation. You know, there are a lot of mortal limitations. One of them is time. One of them is physical strength. One of them is gender. One of them is race. One of them is um, age. One of them is uh, education, the where you started from. Those are all mortal limits. And if we can kind of stay out of that mortal limitation business, uh, freedom occurs and amazing things occur. I was just talking with somebody a few minutes ago who said, why should I plan that this has got to take three years? Why, why should that not just occur? Okay, so we can bust through those time limits and hopefully uh, we'll cover some ideas today that'll help us do that. You know, I, I did want to just show you this picture. I don't know if you've been to Boston, but this is uh, the world headquarters for the Christian Science Organization and the Christian Science Church. This is the church that Mary Baker Eddy founded. Uh, and the reason I just show it is it's kind of a lasting footprint from this individual. The, the, uh, what she contributed was a very uh, beneficial contribution. For instance, this is one of the most beautiful public spaces in the city of Boston. It's a, it's a triangular shaped lot, and it actually unites three neighborhoods, the Back Bay, the South End, and the Fenway. And so rather than having like turf wars where these neighborhoods come together, there's this, pl there's this place. And uh, it's a beautiful space. Um, and in fact, our meeting today is, is kind of a, an echo of the work that she did. Uh, you know, I happen to be a member of the Christian Science Board of Lectureship. I was sponsored by a couple of the local Christian Science churches, and none of that would, have, would exist at all if it hadn't been for what Mary Baker Eddy did. Let's just to give you a sense of who she was. So you don't think that book that I'm recommending just kind of came out of the blue. It came out of a life. Now, um, I've probably already stated a couple of times that if it's yours to do, do it. Don't let the clock, the clock will always tell you you can't do it. There will always be reasons to not do something. Um, and, in, and in time management, for instance, you, you guys know this, they'll always say, learn to say no. You must learn to say no. Um, but I would say no, don't, don't learn to say no. Learn to ask, is this mine to do? Because if it is yours to do, you can do it. You know, there was a, a woman that called me up, um, it was um, around 11 o'clock on a Sunday night. And she was supposed to go to Mexico the next day, but she'd lost her passport. And she thought it had been stolen. And so she called me. Now, you might say, why would you call me at 11 o'clock, right on a Sunday night, looking for a passport? Because I'm not in a passport business. I didn't even know which city she was in. Um, the reason I think she would call a, a Christian science practitioner somebody who is looking beyond the limits at the reality of things, um, you might get a different idea. And she did. So I asked her one question. I asked, is it necessary? This trip, I know you're going to Mexico, you want to go, you bought a ticket, everyone's expecting you. Is it necessary? And she thought a minute and said, um, I think it is. I said, good, go, forget that passport, um, go to Mexico. And I said, when, when is your flight? She said, it's tomorrow at 5 o'clock. 
I said, okay, well, at 1 o'clock, call me and say, Dave, everything's cool. She said, yeah, but how, how is it that you're so confident? I said, I'm pretty confident that you are going to be where you need to be. Uh, and don't let red tape get in the way. And maybe, maybe 10 minutes later or so, she had her passport. And she, uh, all she had done was she opened her suitcase to pack. And in doing so, there was that passport. So is that magic? No. What it is, is it is moving forward. It's practically moving forward. I have a friend who was on her way to Boston through O'Hare and had uh, misplaced her boarding pass. And at that time, the boarding pass was kind of a big, serious financial document. They were handwritten and everything. And uh, yeah, you remember those days? For, that was for your time. Um, well, she lost, she lost hers. And she, she thought, I can't go. Right? That's what, that's what the mortal limit would tell you. You can't do it. And then she remembered, no, 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 no. This is not about red tape. This is about me getting to where I need to be. And I'm, I need to be in Boston, and I'm going to Boston. And she moved toward the plane and uh, got off on one of those moving walkways and uh, saw a, a boarding pass on the ground, picked it up, and it was, it was hers. Now, you might say, well, that seems like magic to me. OK. It defies what we've come to expect, certainly. But it isn't, it isn't magic. It's divinely natural to, to the divine mind. It's divinely natural for us to be able to do whatever it is we need to do. And you know, these days, um, you know, I've, been, I've been traveling around quite a bit, and sometimes it's hard to actually get from point A to point B. I mean, they're grounding planes now and all kinds of stuff and changing schedules without even any warning. Um, but if it's right for you to do it, there'll be a way. So always, always look to what divine mind wants for you to do rather than for what the world is telling you you can do. You know, this little uh, verse, which I've always loved from uh, 2 Timothy, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Now, you know, I came out of the printing business. I did a lot of uh, production management. And I assumed when I read that, that that was a typo, that word truly. I did. I assumed they meant thoroughly. They put truly. That's amazing. They're going to have to fix it when they print it again. Um, but it turns out that it's a, it's a real word. It shows up a few times, obviously an old English word. Um, it shows up six or seven times in the Bible. And I wanted to know what it meant. And what it means, it's got two meanings. Completely equipped and utterly capable. OK, so if we're the man of God, which we are, and we are completely equipped and utterly capable, where do you get the idea that you don't have enough time? Or you don't have enough money? Or you don't have the right education? Or you didn't get an early enough start? Or you should have thought this through better? If you're completely equipped and utterly capable, then that's true right now. You know, I've uh, ridden a, a lot uh, on a motorcycle, probably well over 100,000 miles. And I was riding once across um, the country, and I was, I was headed towards Sault Ste. Marie, which is where the Great Lakes come together, and there's some locks up there. And I was going to cut across Canada. I used to live in uh, Boston. And I was, so I was up, up in the Upper Peninsula, and it was a nice day like this. Um, but it was getting late, maybe uh, 7 or 8 at night, and I thought, you know, that's enough for today. And I pulled into this campground off of this nice little two-lane road, and I figured uh, I'll, I'll get some sleep. And in the morning, another beautiful, bright, sunny, dry day, and I sat at this um, table right along Lake Michigan there. Couldn't have been more beautiful. And I made a few notes. And one of the things I wrote was this. This is um, a statement that was written, um, I don't know, over 100 years ago by Mary Baker Eddy. Remember, thou canst be brought into no condition, be it ever so severe, where love has not been before thee, and where its tender lesson is not awaiting thee. Now, that kind of suggests an ever presence, doesn't it? Kind of suggests an ever presence. You can't go anywhere where this isn't already true. Anyway, I wrote this down kind of from memory, and uh, 
And, uh, and then I hopped on my bike, put all my gear on my bike, and headed north. But now when I got out to this nice little two-lane highway, this was, uh, this was now 8 o'clock in the morning, so it was a very busy highway. A lot of trucks, uh, traffic, everybody's traveling 70 miles an hour. And there's no, there's no way in. There's no entry to this highway. There's no light, nice little ramp. You just have to jump on your accelerator and explode into the traffic. And uh, so anyway, I, I made sure I was clear, and then I did that. And, but when I looked up, I realized I don't have a lane because there's a guy in my lane coming toward me, a big truck, passing another big truck. So I've got two trucks coming toward me at 70 miles an hour, about 100 feet away, which if you do the math on that, that's about a um, little less than one second. Closing interval on that is a little less than one second. So if somebody had given me sort of offline, said, hey, here's how it's going to go. You're going to have a one second to move your motorcycle from in front of a truck traveling 70 miles an hour. Uh, I would say, no, I'm not going to do that because there's not enough time for that. But uh, if it comes up, um, this, is what, this is what I noticed during that one second. The first thing I noticed from the, li the lines painted on the road is that the driver of the truck was making a legal pass. And you might say, but that's irrelevant. And I would say, sure. But it's just the first thing I noticed. The second thing I saw was the driver of the truck was trying to make room for me. You could just almost feel him trying to ease his truck out of, out of the, toward the center line. And then I saw a little sliver of asphalt just outside the lane, and I put my bike there and raised my right hand to sort of signal to the driver, don't jack, do, do not slam on your brakes. Just roll through here. Because if you'll roll through here, I think I'm going to be OK. And I noticed he, who was like right here now, he, 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 he reached across his steering wheel and kind of waved to me. OK. And then we went by. Now. Um, so that's a lot, right, for one second. You wouldn't, you wouldn't maybe think you could do all that in one second. There was, there was recognition. There was awareness. Like, like to look up and see that, I didn't have to go, now what is this? Now what is this now? I just, I'm, it was immediate. And I knew that it had to be resolved immediately. And it was resolved immediately. There was recognition. There was communication. There was goodwill. There was activity expressed. There was intelligence expressed. There was even a little gentlemanliness um, between two guys sharing a road. Uh, and then I went by. And I had to stay where I was for another couple of seconds because uh, there was a couple cars behind him making the same pass. So I just had to sort of stay where I was. And then I accelerated into the lane and headed for Sault Ste. Marie. But I was thinking about that. I thought, you know, that was severe. That might have been ever so severe. I thought, I thought that whole thing couldn't have taken uh, one second, the whole thing. And so I thought, well, what's my tender lesson? And as I was riding north, I was just considering this. And I thought, I know what the lesson is. The time can't take away your life, or the lack of it, or the tick, tick, tick of it, or the all at once of it. Time and life are two different things. Time is a mortal thing, and life is spiritual. And they do not actually join. Humanly, we're told that they join. But from a divine standpoint, they do not. Time is mortal, and life is spiritual. And as I was riding along, I, I thought of this. This is another one of these little, these little gems that has been hidden for plain sight for thousands of years. So Peter wrote this. He glimpsed something. One day with the Lord is as a thousand years. And I was just kind of considering that as I was riding uh, north. And I thought, well, if one day is as a thousand years, I wonder what one second is. And I did that arithmetic. Because it's a little bit of a convoluted computation. But by the time you do it, it turns out it's 4.2 days. So one. <laughs> One second with the Lord <laughs> equals 4.2 days. If you can, if you can uh, use that as like a spiritual equation, 
which suggests then that time's not a factor, right? Because if somebody said you're going to have 4.2 days to move your motorcycle from in front of a truck, <laughs> time's not even a factor there. Why would you even mention it? Right? Because you, you could paint the, the lines in, in 4.2 days. <laughs> if you allow a spiritual awareness to govern your life, there will never be an accident. There will never be a death. So what's the factor? If, if, um, if time doesn't do it, what does do it? You know, um, uh, let me just read it to you. There's a, there's a statement in, in this book, and it's probably um, repeated multiple, multiple times. But it's a distinction that's made between Jesus and this Christ. Now, Jesus was known for doing miracles, right? He did miracles. Do you know um, there was a miracle where he fed the multitude, right? Do you know how many people were there? How many? 5,000. Total? Total? No. Plus women and children. Yeah. And we know how much food they had, right? How much food did they have? Five loaves and two fish, right? And we know that they had some extras. And I, Jesus told them to count the extras, right? And he remembered it later. He said, did you guys forget about the 12 baskets we picked up? I think Jesus recognized that something actually interesting was happening on that occasion. And he, and he wanted to know the count. And do you remember, by the way, how that happened? How did they get there? They were his audience. They were his audience. Did he invite them in? No. No. They, yes. they were uninvited. They followed him. As my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, my understanding is he was actually trying to get away. And, and, they, and they followed him. And, 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 it, and the Bible says, and they were a sheep not having a shepherd, and he had compassion on them and taught them many things. Now, he spoke to them all day long, because I think it was dinner time when it became too late, and his disciples came and said, you gotta send these people away. And he said, why? He said, Be, they said, because it's dinner time and we don't have enough to feed them. And he said, what do you have? Now, they've already told him we don't have. His one question is, what do you have? Like, what do you already have? And they said, well, we've got these five loaves and two fish, but they belittled it. You know, that's not enough. How many times have we said, well, that's just not enough? You know, I've got this, but, but that's not enough. But Jesus didn't, Jesus didn't bite on that. Because they, they came to him and said, we don't have. And he could have said, oh, yeah, you're right. We should have thought better. We should have planned better. We should have brought more. He didn't say that. He said, what do you have? They have this little thing. And he said, bring that to me. When you say bring it to me, this is where the distinction comes, I think, between Jesus the man and Jesus the Christ. And let me just share one or two of these with you guys. Um, this book, Science and Health, makes this point many, many times, many different ways. But here, here's a, a couple of them. Jesus was born of Mary. Christ is the true idea voicing good, the divine message from God to men speaking to the human consciousness. There it is again. It's the divine message from God to men speaking to the human consciousness. Remember what we read in the preface? That this is an ever-present divine influence, ever-present in human consciousness? Okay, the, the word Christ is not properly a synonym for Jesus, though it is commonly so used. Christ expresses God's spiritual, eternal nature. Okay. If we're going to express that humanly, um, you know what the word miracle means, by the way? You, you've heard the word miracle many times. And, and we've come to expect that it is something unexpected, right? We've come to think of it as something rare, something that you would never kind of plan on. Um, I, I remember seeing an old uh, uh, New Yorker cartoon with a great big uh, computation. And in the middle, it says, then a miracle happens. So, you, know, you wouldn't count on a miracle. 
It's something that happens rarely, maybe once in a lifetime, maybe once in somebody else's lifetime. Um, but let me read from this book about the word miracle. This is from the glossary. There's a little glossary of terms near the back here. It's only 20 or so pages, but it includes a lot of like Bible terms, Bible names, and it gives this spiritual interpretation of Bible names. And one of those words is miracle. And here's what it says. That which is divinely natural, but must be learned humanly. Okay, it is divinely natural and it can be learned humanly. And perhaps in a, in a meeting like this, we have an opportunity to consider some of that, that we can accept for ourselves what is divinely natural, but seems miraculous. You know, let me share one more thing while we're at it on, um, you know, from Mary Baker Eddy. She described kind of what she was trying to accomplish with this book. She said, I saw before me the sick wearing out years of servitude to an unreal master in the belief that the body governed them rather than mind. The lame, the deaf, the dumb, the blind, the sick, the sensual, the sinner, I wished to save from the slavery of their own beliefs and from the educational systems of the pharaohs. Well, we've come to believe that that which is divinely natural is rare. We've been taught that. We've been exposed to that, and we've come to, to accept it, that that which is divinely natural is actually rare. What we should, um, what we should know is that, the, that these miracles are not that miraculous. You remember what, uh, you remember what our friend uh, George Musser said? He said, these phenomena so violate what we, become, what we believe about the physical world that they appear almost magical or miraculous but they shouldn't. We should, we should uh, have higher expectations for what is possible. We, and and there, therein lies the, 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 the question, it not is can I do this, but should I do this? Now, um, this Christ, this timeless Christ that is um, present, omnipresent, very present, and uh, the, uh, this, this uh, Christ presence in human consciousness enables us to do things freely, much more freely than the world has taught us that we can. Do you guys know who Roger Bannister is by any chance? Do you know this guy? Yeah, he, um, he's the one that broke the, uh, the four minute mile in uh, 1953. And I saw a documentary about him and, he, and they, they, had, they had come to believe that it was a a, a physiological barrier. And when you talk to Roger Bannister, he's an old guy now, but he said, I knew it wasn't physiological. I knew it was a mental barrier, and I knew someone was going to break it. And he figured, why shouldn't it be me? <laughs> you know, this is just an, uh, kind of a little illustration. And we're not talking about light. Light travels at the speed of light. We're talking about thought which travels at the speed of thought, which is immediate. But it makes, a, it makes a point. If you consider that white light to be that Christ consciousness, that Christ awareness, that Christ truth, that pure truth that's always been true and always will be, and then you consider the prism, for instance, to be the human consciousness, what happens is it explodes into color and harmony and usefulness and ideas, practical, useful ideas. Um, and again, it's, uh, it's just an illustration. These illustrations are, are good only so far. But it, it does suggest that allowing ourselves to, um, to uh, enable our thought to be free to accept the truth, the, uh, that which is divinely natural, it becomes true humanly. We can learn it humanly. Now, it's not going to be more time. Um, you know, we're coming up on April 15. I don't know how many of you are ready for your, for your taxes, but you may be thinking you're going to need more time. You may already be planning on, a, on getting yourself an extension. Um, my own thought on that would be just move forward as best you can with what you have. 
just move forward. Maybe you need an extension, in which case God will give you an extension. But generally, an extension is not really going to give you what you need. An extension is going to simply delay the inevitable. And um, what we're really looking for is the, the fulfillment of today's requirements. And we can do that. We have what we need. Uh, we already have whatever it is that we need. You know, I have a friend who um, is an architect, and he was, uh, I guess it was an architectural model that he was due, due with. He was late with. And it was irretrievably late. It was no way he was going to make it. And it was starting to make him nervous. If you let time get in the driver's seat, it'll make you nervous. That's where stress is. That's what stress is. And uh, he was feeling that stress. And it affected his sleep, and it affected what he was eating, and all the rest of that. And then um, he sneezed one time. And this little girl said, God bless you. She might have been 10 years old. And he thought, oh, look at that. This little girl calls for this blessing. It just caught his attention. And suddenly, he got an idea. And the idea was, you don't have to spray paint those pieces. You, could, you don't have to paint them with a brush. You can spray paint them, which is fast. I don't know if you've done some spray painting, but it's way, way, way fast. And he turned that project in early. You know, um, it was just the other day I woke up in Chicago and flew out across Catalina Island and back to Las Vegas. And I was there by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, something like that. I woke up in Chicago, went out across the coast here, and back to Las Vegas by 2 o'clock in the afternoon. Now, time zones were part of that. But the point is, that's a lot to accomplish in a few hours. If, if we tried to do that um, 100 years ago, that would have taken months. But it, it does. It took a few hours. It took five hours or something like that to accomplish that. Why? Because there have been ideas that have unfolded a continuous succession of better ideas. And ideas always eclipse time. Ideas are light uh, coming into the human experience. And they take out the mortal limits. And time being, time being chief among them, maybe. Um, truth has always been true. And, it, and if, uh, if I were taking notes, I'd probably write this down. This is probably, the, this is probably as important as anything we're going to say here today that the truth that has ever been true is still true. Um, truth doesn't come and go. Uh, things come and go. Uh, political parties come and go. Um, governments come and go. Fashion comes and goes. Uh, customs come and go. But truth does not. Two plus two is four. And it always has been. And it will always be. And you'll be able to base any kind of computation forever on that truth. Um, you know, anybody read that book by uh, David McCulloch about the Wright brothers? Uh, yeah, yeah. They, they, Wilbur Wright, the older brother, used to be asked to speak occasionally about what they were learning. And he picked up a piece of paper one time and just dropped it. And the paper fluttered to the ground. He said, all we're trying to do is understand that. OK? They're not making that up. They're just trying to understand it. Well, what we're trying to do is understand spiritual life, the spiritual nature of life, the truth that's always been true. And uh, you know, one time I was um, cooking some spaghetti in a dark kitchen. For some reason, I still do this. I was doing this the other night. I caught myself. The kitchen's just dimly lit, and I was cooking. And uh, a noodle uh, rolled off across this uh, cooktop, a hard noodle, and I went and picked it up but I had to press my fingers down hard to pick this thing up. And uh, in doing so, I burned up my hand. And I was just devastated because, for one thing, it hurt like crazy. And I thought, oh, man, and I, I've ruined, you know, I've messed up my hand. And now I'm standing here in a daze and throbbing pain and all this in the dark. And, um, and then as I was standing there, the thought came to me, well, you know, 2,500 years ago, there were three guys that went into this fire. <laughs> and they weren't harmed by that, somehow. Uh, they weren't even touched by it. And I thought, whatever was true for those guys is still true. 
And um, in the morning, when I went to uh, get into the shower, I looked at my fingers. I thought, this is going to hurt. That hot water across his hand is going to hurt. But it didn't hurt. And I noticed the hand was perfect. So Jesus said this, too. He said, um, ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And so my thought would be, anyone who's ever proven something just proves that it is true. It, it's not like something happened 2,500 years ago that it'll never happen again. Something happened 25 years ago, 2,500 years ago, that shows what's possible. And, uh, and my life uh, is another example of it because I was totally free like that. Because what does it take to, to heal up some burned up fingers? You know, it takes time, right? But not in that case. And, and what is it, why not? Because I accepted the idea that there was a truth and that it was true for me. You know, I have a friend who's, um, I used to work with this woman, and she, as I understand it, was before I knew her, but she couldn't walk for 10 years. She wasn't able to walk. And um, one day she was reading this book, and it was almost like this little divine influence, almost like a little whisper that came to her that said, you know, this is true for you. And that was the end of that problem. She's been up ever since. She um, fairly recently sailed her sailboat from the Atlantic Ocean into Lake Michigan, where she lives. So she's, she's full on um, physically. Um, so in other words, she took this thing which is divinely natural and learned it humanly. You've all heard that time heals all wounds. But you know that's like a wives' tale. That's like a, that's like a little saying. Because I'll bet you, you also know somebody who has been betrayed or stabbed or something by somebody, and they, can't, and they just can't get beyond that. Something happens somewhere, and they're just not getting beyond it. Or what about uh, chronic, chronic illness, which just simply means over time. I mean, if, if time healed, why would we have chronic illness? OK, what does heal? Thought heals. Changing thought. Allow your thought to change. Allow it to change. Learn what is divinely natural. Be willing to learn. Despite the fact that we have been taught the educational systems of the pharaohs and we become slaves of our own beliefs, we can put that down. And I'll give you an example. One time I was, I was, um, I had sprained an ankle. Okay, I'll just tell you this story quickly. I had sprained an ankle. I sprained my ankles a lot, all my life. And I've taped them up a lot. And I've worn sleeves on them and different things and neoprene stuff so that I could, could continue to play. A lot of like exoskeleton stuff. <laughs> Pump up basketball shoes, all that, all that to strengthen, to stabilize those ankles. So I taped up my ankle, but the ankle was still weak. And I took, actually, I ended up taking six weeks off. OK, now six weeks is a long time to invest into healing. Right? Six, I'm going to give this six weeks of, of time off. And then I was walking in the woods with my dogs, and I sprained that ankle again. And what a huge setback. What a devastating thing that is when you've already invested six weeks, and now you're back to square one. And the thought came to me, you know, Dave, um, time and rest are not making your ankle stronger. If anything, it's getting weaker. You're, you're just walking your dogs now, spraining your ankle. <laughs> you got to think differently. And I thought, OK, I, I, I'll do that. And it came to me, you got to think radically differently. So I thought, OK, what's the radical thought here? So I'm standing alone in the woods on one foot, and I'm thinking, what's the radical thought? And it came to me immediately, immediately. The original accident never happened. That's radical, right? That's crazy radical. I'm standing on one foot. The original accident never happened. So I say to myself, maybe aloud, I don't know, I was in the woods alone. I accept the original accident never happened. Now what? Because I'm still on one foot. And the thought came to me, 
you better be careful walking out of here though because there's ice and snow, right? And it was at that point that I caught myself. And I thought, if it had never happened, would I be careful? And I thought, no, I wouldn't. And I, bang, I just started walking. I put the ankle down, bang, hard, and walked out. And I've been walking ever since. And I've been playing ever since. And I've never taped it again. And I've never sprained it again, any of them. I used to sprain them both. Um, OK, so here it is. It's not time, because time didn't do me any good. It's thought. And I was willing to accept a radical, radical thought. And so I recommend that. I recommend that you accept the radical thought that you are not material, but spiritual. And it says that that gets echoed over and over and over in this book, is your, your life is actually spiritual. It's not based on material laws, including time and age. Um, the world wants to know your age. It's a convenient way for them to categorize us. Um, but I recommend you kind of stay clear of it for yourself. I wouldn't lie about your age. I, I, I'm always honest. Somebody asked me my age. I, I remember it. However, I was, I was listening to a, an interview with Mick Jagger the other day and asked him his age, and he said, I don't know. So, <laughs> so um, he may not know. And I know there are people who just lose track of it. But um, generally, I would just stay out of it. Um, don't think of yourself as an age. Like, I could describe myself demographically. I could say, you know, I'm a white dude. I live in Chicago in a certain zip code. I'm a certain age. I've got a certain education. Um, or I could say, no, I'm just throughly furnished. I'm a spiritual idea. I'm timeless. I'm ageless. I'm learning. I'm trying to learn humanly what is divinely natural. And that has nothing to do with time. It has nothing to do with time. You know, one, one of those slides, I don't know if you noticed it, but it said uh, it was a physicist, um, a, a guy named uh, Lawrence Doyle. And he said, there's never been a connection drawn between the, the movement of the Earth around the sun and the aging of the human body. It's just something people have come to believe. OK, so we can come to not believe it or disbelieve it. And, uh, and just think of yourself as free of age, frankly, free of all uh, mortal limitations. Uh, you can do whatever it is that God wants for you to do. You know, there is a reading list, and I know they've got some on a table out there. You might want to grab a copy of it, but it's, um, you may not. It's 16 pages long, so you may decide that's too much. But it's just a bunch of articles that I've collected around this topic, and you can grab one if you want, or you can download it. I'll show you where to download it. But um, one of those articles is an article called High Stakes Project Led by Prayer. And this young woman is managing this very big deal, a lot of money involved, a lot of people looking at it, watching it, stakeholders all through the organization. And she's getting it done until somebody threw a curve, as they sometimes do, and say, uh, we're also going to need this. And that, that happens, right? Um, and all of a sudden, she realized, this thing's coming apart. I'm not going to get this done, actually. And so she went to see her boss. And she was on the stairway to go and see her boss. And an idea came to her. And by the way, coincidentally and interestingly, I think, the idea was we already have that. That which she seemed to lack, she said, uh, she realized we already have it. It was in a different form. She had to make a phone call to get it kind of repositioned or, or kind of reorganized. But she made that phone call, turned around, walked down the stairs, and went back to work. So if you think that your job is to put in hours, let's say eight hours, it's not your job. Your job is to deliver thought, and ideas, problem solving, usefulness, um, progress. That's your job. And that's how, that's how mind measures time. Finally, you know, I, I, I will. I just kind of touch on this maybe. One of the early, early issues of the Christian Science Journal, um, maybe as far back as 1883, but it was certainly in one of those early years, was an article called The New Birth. And this is just a sentence from The New Birth, from that article, near the top of the article. It says, the new birth is not the work of a moment, but it does begin with moments. 
goes on with years. Moments of surrender to God. It doesn't say go split the atom. Moments of surrender to God. You're supposed to go to Mexico? You're supposed to do this? Is this necessary? Because if it is, do it. Surrender to God. Childlike trust. Joyful adoption of good. Moments of self-abnegation. You know what self-abnegation is, right? It's, um, it's another theme that you'll find in here repeated numerous times. And it has to do with unselfishness, um, selflessness, um, the golden rule, treating others the way you would like to be treated, um, finding your own and another's good. It's, it's truly unselfish. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a real quick example. Um, I was playing basketball in a gym north of Chicago, and I took my coat off and put it on the floor. I figured I'd just watch it. And, you know, I'm only going to be right here on this gym. And um, about a minute later, less than a minute later, I noticed my coat was gone. And so I was kind of, you know, I was lo looking around and a little agitated. And uh, I was running around, and um, I came to this doorway. I was going to go outside and look outside. And three guys were walking up the stairs to the same landing. And the thought came to me, you know, normally you would hold the door. You know, being a gentleman, you would hold this door. But now, because you're in this big rush, you don't have time to hold the door for these guys. And then I kind of caught myself. I said, really? Has it come to that now where I can't even hold the door? And I thought, you know, I may, never, may never see that coat again, but I am going to hold this door. And I just stood there, and one of these three guys was wearing my coat. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I'm not that swift. I'm not that fleet of foot. So I'm not sure I could have caught up with him outside. But when he brought it right to me like that, it was very easy, very easy to retrieve. So this idea of self-abnegation which it took a moment of self-abnegation. It took me truly to get a hold of myself and decide, who am I today? Am I a gentleman today or not? And when I, took, when I made that decision, that coat came right to me. OK, self-consecration, heaven-born hope, and spiritual love. So those are our moments. So quickly, just to recap what we've been talking about, this is the truth. This is not some ology, it is not some made up something. This is just the truth, and people have glimpsed it for thousands of years. The Bible contains it in many, many, many uh, specifics. Science and Health explains it. Again, they've got some copies out here if you want to grab one. In metaphysics, time is irrelevant. In physics, it's a key thing, troublesome, you know, problematic, but key. But in metaphysics, it's totally irrelevant. Um, if it's yours to do, you can do it. Assume that. If, it's, if this is really mine to do, then it's really God's doing it, and I'm just part of that. So if it's yours to do, go about it. Be about it. Um, and it's the Christ that enables it. The Christ is not caught up in what do we have, like, like um, we only have five loaves or two fish. That was plenty to accomplish that, and they had leftovers. So it's not a matter of um, what do we have, how much time do we have. The question is what is right to do. If it's ever been true, then it's still true, and it's true for you, and it's true for all of us. Um, time is not a factor in healing. Time does not heal. Uh, other things heal. Thought changing heals. Spiritual uh, reality heals. Um, the truth learned humanly that which is divinely natural, learned humanly, heals. Be as deliberately ageless as you can be. In, in Spanish, they have a little phrase, uh, tengo muchos años, pero no tengo edad. I have many years, but no age. Uh, let me read one quick thing from Science and Health on this topic of age. The measurement of life by solar years robs youth, gives ugliness to age never record ages. Chronological data are no part of the vast forever, and timetables of birth and death are so many conspiracies against manhood and womanhood. You know, we, we talked earlier that uh, 
Life is spiritual and time is mortal. Timetables of birth and death have nothing to do with the eternal life. And then your job really is to think. You, 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 somewhere, I think it's one of the very first sentences in this book, the time for thinkers has come. So we're not here just filling a chair, warming a chair for eight hours a day. We're actually delivering thought and care and interest and ideas and uh, progress, accomplishment. And uh, all of our moments belong to God. Everything we have belongs to God. Everything we have. Yeah, I think all we're really saying there is time doesn't give you anything, really. What you want to do is eliminate time. What you want are ideas. Ideas will, will bring you progress. Thank you, guys. You've been great. I love being with you. <laughs>